Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our webinar, EMA Perspective on Frailty in Clinical Trials. My name is Cynthia Benz, and I serve as Vice President of Public Policy at the Alliance for Aging Research, and I also serve as Executive Director of the Aging in Motion, or AIM, Coalition. I'll be moderating today's program. Uh, before we begin, I'd first like to provide some background on sarcopenia and the AIM Coalition. Sarcopenia is age-related loss of skeletal muscle. Starting in middle age, we all begin experiencing muscle loss, no matter how much time we spend exercising. The problem is that for some people, this loss of muscle, muscle is faster and more severe. Their muscle loss impacts their strength, and this group of people gets into trouble later in life when they don't have enough strength to do the things they need to do to live independently. These older adults find it increasingly difficult to stand up, to walk, climb stairs, cook, purchase groceries, and even use the bathroom without assistance. They also tend to have more complications recovering from injuries commonly experienced by the elderly, like hip fracture. An inability to carry out activities of daily living like these or to fully recover from injury are major causes for many older adults ending up in assisted living facilities or nursing homes. And this institutionalization is at great financial cost to people, their families, and society. So the Aging in Motion Coalition is made up of 30 nonprofit uh, patient and research advocacy organizations working together to increase recognition of sarcopenia and age-related uh, functional decline. AIM was founded in 2011, and our core goal is to promote clear clinical development and regulatory pathways for effective treatments that can improve the lives of people with sarcopenia. We do this by convening some of the greatest minds uh, who are conducting research in this area, and our current scientific advisory board um, is listed on the slide. Uh, we also engage with industry to strategically undertake activities that will produce results that are of use in the diagnosis and treatment of sarcopenia. And we also work directly with regulatory bodies in advancing our activities because we want to be sure that whatever we do meets their needs as well. Uh, we've had a positive and ongoing interaction with both the FDA and EMA on sarcopenia. Among other things, FDA continues to work with AIM on the qualification of the short physical performance battery and usual gait speed for use as performance outcome measures. They're also going to be convening a patient-focused drug development meeting on sarcopenia in fiscal year 2017 to increase their understanding of the sarcopenic patient's experience and their hopes for potential treatments. We're incredibly excited that the doors that both of these initiatives are going to open for sarcopenia product development. The EMA spent the better part of a decade uh, focused on ways to overcome special challenges that elderly patients present for drug development across therapeutic areas, including sarcopenia. They launched a geriatric medicines initiative and released a draft paper in December highlighting points to consider on frailty. This paper specifically identifies instruments that could be used for baseline characterization of populations for clinical trials. And we have a stellar expert for you here this morning who's going to provide her thoughts on this very subject. And to me, she really is the heart and soul of what EMA is uh, doing in this area, so we're all in for a treat. Uh, the questions will be reserved for the Q&A period at the end of the program, but as you think of questions, feel free to use the WebEx chat function or email cbenz at agingresearch.org and we'll add your questions to the queue. And last but not least, I'd like to recognize AIM sponsors, Abbott, Eli Lilly and Company, GE Healthcare, Hologic, Novartis, Nutricia, Regeneron, and Sanofi. Without your support, programs like the one today would not be possible, so thank you so much for your commitment. And I'm already predicting that this is going to be a success, um, so I'd like to thank my colleagues Sarah DeGiovene, Noel Lloyd, and Ryan Carney for their help with the webinar. We're fortunate to have Dr. Francesca Serretta as our guest speaker. Dr. Serretta is joining us from the EMA. She's been with EMA since 1996. And um, there she covered uh, several roles, uh, a senior scientific officer in the area of quality of medicines with a focus on innovative biotechnologies in scientific advice, where she coordinated the establishment of the parallel scientific advice procedure and in the CNS section of the safety and efficacy of medicines. Since 2010, she served as the coordinator of the EMA Geriatric Medicines Initiative aiming to improve the assessment of benefits and risk balance of drugs in the older population. In 2014, this expanded to include gender issues. 
Dr. Toretta is the EMA representative for a health technology assessment IMI project, Get Real, about the use of real-world data to streamline product development and an additional project in the development of sarcopenia drugs. Since the launch of the EMA Adaptive Licensing Project in March 2014, she shares the coordination of the implementation of the project. And earlier in her career, she worked as a research scientist at Merck in the field of molecular biology and for Eli Lilly in clinical research. Um, she's going to provide an overview of the EMA geriatric medicine strategy, regulatory considerations on frailty as a stratification criteria in randomized control trials, and perspective on sarcopenia as a potential indication. So Dr. Soretta, please take it away. Thank you, Cynthia, for your kind uh, introduction and for inviting me to present the EMA perspective. I hope you can all hear me fine, just if you could confirm that. Yeah, I hope so. Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Okay, fantastic. fantastic. So, um, I'm really happy to be participating to this seminar because uh, Aging in Motion is really doing stellar work in, in pushing forward the frailty and sarcopenia agenda. Um, and I would like to share with you some points that uh, of the thinking that the EMA has come to have, both in the aspects of using frailty as a stratification criterion in the populations which is enrolled in clinical trials or registries, and also on our current thinking on sarcopenia as a potential indication and target for pharmacological intervention. So if you can go at the next slide. Now, what is the EMA? This is very briefly for those of you who may not be familiar. In the shortest possible definition, it is like the Food and Drug Administration for the European uh, Union, um, minus the food part. Uh, we have a number of committees that are dedicated to the evaluation of drugs and of pharmacovigilance, both for humans and animals. And uh, uh, we are based in London. Next slide. Um, now, this presentation will be in three parts, a very, very brief overview of our me geriatric medicine strategy. For more detail, I would refer you either to our website or if you're interested, please contact me and you can ask me further questions. The second point will be regulatory consideration on frailty as a stratification criterion for randomized clinical trials. And the third, as I mentioned, is uh, you, uh, looking at sarcopenia as potentially an indication. So. In the next slide, we can see what sparked a bit of the interest of the EMA into putting up a geriatric medicine strategy. We did an analysis of the patients that were enrolled in clinical trials in, um, in, the, area, in the cardiovascular area and other areas. And, um, and in the cardiovascular, here is an example. Uh, the, the population is clearly skewed towards a younger population, although for the 65 to 74 age bracket, the representation of patients is uh, reasonable and, and quite well made. Uh, as soon as patients get older, 75 plus, the, um, the, 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 the representativeness of the clinical trials drop. And this, nevertheless, uh, against the fact that uh, older patients are major users of medicines and uh, represent more than half of the prescriptions normally. Next slide. What we can see here is that the, the uh, EMA uh, based their strategy on two principles. The first one it was to look at uh, what data we had, where the data uh, representative of the population that would use the drug, so uh, to base ourselves on evidence in our decision making. And in this respect, we would like to make a difference as compared to pediatrics. Uh, young patients are a special population because they're not major users of medicines. We consider that older patients are integral part of um, the population that will use medicines and therefore they should be evaluated in the mainstream uh, of the evaluation. The second point is that sometimes we do have the data, but we don't express clearly the significance of this data in uh, the summary of product characteristics and, and other approval documents. So we wanted to improve the availability of information on the use of medicines for older people to help people to make a more informed decision on treating patients. 
Um, in the next slide, we have very briefly the uh, um, a, a mentioning of the new clinical trial regulation that is about to enter into force in Europe. This was approved in 2014. And again, in this regulation, an article reinforces the message that the population should be representative, and if not, uh, the sh sh justification should be provided. So, next slide. Um, now, in terms of uh, uh, um, looking at uh, what the CHMP, so the Committee for Human Medicinal Products, is doing, it will it has started for 2016 a pilot in 10 products where the the approval documents uh, will have an in-depth analysis of geriatric data, starting from the epidemiology of the disease in question, looking at the data that. Uh, are uh, uh, um, presented in the randomized clinical trial submitted and commenting specifically on any pharmacovigilance measures that are decided. In, at the same time, last year, the Food and Drug Administration started the, what they call the drug trial snapshot, which was mainly driven by um, uh, sex differences in the representation of patients, but it includes sex, age, and age where patients over 65 are mentioned specifically. Now, all of this, though, uh, leaves us, uh, in, in the next slide, um, to the consideration, is age actually the best predictor of the po potential susceptibility to adverse outcomes, or is something else? Um, I was working in the revision of the, uh, go to the next slide, I was working in, in the revision of the ICHE 7, which is the ICH guideline uh, regarding older populations. And there was uh, quite a substantial discussion on whether other criteria should be utilized, but no consensus on frailty. And uh, in that respect, uh, we know that age, chronological age, is a suboptimal predictor of susceptibility to adverse outcomes. So we have started to look whether frailty could have been a better descriptor of how the population in the clinical trials was representing patients that perhaps were um, um, less well-off and more susceptible to uh, the pot potential adverse outcomes. Now, the golden standard for, a, for, for assessing the frailty status of a patient we recognize is, of course, a comprehensive geriatric assessment. But the thing is that this assessment is time-consuming, requires specialized training, and it's impractical for uh, a routine characterization of a randomized clinical trial population. So what we wanted to see is, in the next slide, is there anything that is validated and simple that we could uh, sort of advise for use uh, either in uh, the clinical trials uh, for the registration or in post authorization if any um, data specifically or investigations are required for patients that uh, uh, are frailer? Uh, so, um, next slide, please we have come up with a document which is currently under consultation and I would like to invite you to go and look at it. I hope Cynthia, the slides will be available afterwards. Uh, it's for consultation until the 31st of May. And uh, this document says draft points to consider on frailty for baseline characteriz characterization of trial populations. Um, looks at frailty under four different aspects. Uh, go to the next slide. So, it is something that is intended to characterize the population as baseline, so not an instrument to measure change in the frailty status uh, for clinical development. And uh, it's, uh, there are four aspects considered in the document. The physical frailty, which is the one that uh, is sort of uh, considered to be more predictive and, and more all-encompassing. But in certain cases, based on the pharmacodynamic of the products, you may want to explore different domains in the cognitive function, nutritional status, or multimorbidities. So uh, the frailty status or the lack of any frail patients may be utilized in the regulatory decisions, for example, to ask for subsequent uh, um, specific analysis in pharmacovigilance. Next slide. Now, <clears throat> 
The instruments that are advocated in this document have been selected on the basis of two main criteria, the ease of use, the validation status, and predictive value. So, as I mentioned, the physical frailty is the preferred instrument. Now, in the next slide, we see the physical frailty. Uh, two instruments are recommended. The first one is the short physical performance battery because it can be um, utilized uh, uh, with relative ease and without the need of any sp or specialist equipment. And the second choice, the walking speed, that uh, although um, less strongly predictive or adverse outcomes are still a very strong predictive value. So in the next slide, we see that the advantages of the SPTB are that it is uh, a simple alternative to more complex measures. It has been used extensively in clinical sectives and, uh, and identifies reliably the vulnerability of these patients. Um, it appears to integrate multiple facets because it looks at three different aspects uh, of, uh, of aging, and uh, it may offer advantages over self-report <coughs> self measures of functional limitations in terms of validity, reproducibility, sensitivity to changes, and applicability to cross-national and cross-cultural studies. So we welcome very much the efforts that also Aging in Motion is doing in terms of uh, having the, the scale qualified. In the next slide, there are some limitations, of course, of the SPPB. It was not originally developed to identify frailty. It can have a floor effect so that the most strongly affected patients um, couldn't uh, uh, really give us a meaningful result, but we don't expect either that these patients would be enrolled in a clinical trial, unfortunately. And it requires a minimum of instrumentation, but uh, uh, that, that is considered to be you know, within the acceptable requirements that could be put, uh, put towards uh, performing it. Uh, so, uh, we had some preliminary comments, including some that we have received from the Food and Drug Administration, and we will have to respond after the consultation ends uh, to these comments in terms of either accepting them or justifying why they haven't been taken on board. Next slide will show uh, what uh, is the, um, uh, the scales advice for cognitive dysfunction, and the one that is mostly uh, supported is the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, is preferred, um, as it is also uh, being developed uh, with a specific uh, um, uh, focus on, on elderly. For frail and malnutrition, in the next slide, we have, uh, um, by the way, I wanted also to mention that uh, if, if uh, Cynthia makes the slides available, there are no, uh, footnotes on, the, on each of these slides, so you have a bit more information that reports as well what is in the, in the document for consultation, so you can have a sort of summary for each of these items. For frailty malnutrition, you have uh, uh, a, a, a mini nutritional state of short form, and this would be um, advocated in situations where the pharmacodynamic profile of a product indicates that this is appropriate, in particular if the product may cause loss of appetite and then worsen the, the, the clinical presentation of the patients. The last one uh, in the next slide is the multimorbidity and the cumulative illness rating scale for geriatrics is uh, um, suggested. We probably think that the multimorbidity aspects will be particularly interest for the use in post authorization where we want to, for example, look at um, cohorts of patients uh, uh, in, in registries or, or, or specific observational studies where we may want to see um, how multimorbid patients fare with a certain product. So, as conclusions of on, in the next slide, on the frailty as a stratification criteria in randomized clinical trials, we recognize that older people are often excluded from clinical trials, and we would wish that the population in, enrolled in the trials would be as representative as possible of the target population. The assessment of the physical frailty and, uh, and other related domains would allow a better characterization than the chronological age, and um, it may also allow the identification of subgroups of older patients where a different risk to benefit ratio in the effect of the, of the medicinal product uh, is present. 
Um, this is also something that we think could be of help, as I mentioned, in the post authorization phase. In the next slide, we have the third point for this presentation, which are regulatory considerations on sarcopenia as a potential indication uh, for the development of, um, of medicinal products to treat sarcopenia. Now, if we go to the next slide, um, this is the general regulatory view on what is needed <coughs> for outcome measures to be able to support the drug labeling claim. And this is also very well explained in a, in a number of guidance documents from the Food and Drug Administration. So what you measure, the clinical irrelevant concept of this interest is the first uh, uh, ring of the chain. It has to be clinically relevant. And here I would like to stress that uh, while uh, a lot of the research on uh, muscle mass and muscle strength is um, it's very interesting in terms of proof of concept. This is not something that, uh, from a regulatory point of view, is probably uh, an interesting endpoint. Because uh, in the end, the question will always arise, what does this mean for the patient? And all the more in Europe, but I, I guess increasingly also in the US, uh, payers, so insurers, the ones that will need to pay for the drugs, Will, will want to see outcomes that have a, a, a meaning on fun functionality of the patients. The second point, uh, ring of the chain, is how you measure with a strong attention to the content validity that you're actually measuring what you need to measure. And only after you have built a strong chain in this sense, you can go for a drug labeling claim. So uh, in the next slide, the first question is, of course, arises, is sarcopenia a recognized condition? Now, at the current state of knowledge, I don't think that an overarching concept of sarcopenia is acceptable. It doesn't mean that this couldn't be happening in the future, but at present, it is preferable to use models of the disease or of the condition that will be, um, allow a cla be allowing a claim, claim. So for models, I would, um, for example, consider hip fractures, COPD, or cancer cachexia. And this also allows you to define better the population to be treated, because the point is that the general sarcopenia population, again, at the present state of knowledge, is probably not possible to be defined. And the third point is the characteristics and severity that justify. Here I've written clinical, I should have written a pharmacological intervention, because of course you <clears throat> may first decide to start with uh, in nutritional and exercise interventions, but uh, for a drug claim, you will need to have uh, a, a, a definition of degree of severity that will justify a pharmacological intervention. Next slide. Now, how we develop a drug for sarcopenia? Uh, so, as I said, there is a number of potential populations for clinical investigation hip fracture, COPD, cancer cachexia, but confounding factors are a big problem. For example, in a hip fracture, how do you uh, extricate the, the, the problems in mobility that are due to the pain from the problems in mobility <coughs> due to sarcopenia? In COPD, you may wonder, am I going to have a problem if by increasing the muscle mass, then I increase the oxygen requirements uh, for the um, patient, and therefore uh, but I increase the muscle mass, but at the same time I worsen the COPD presentation. So again, the purely sarcopenic population at, the, at this stage of knowledge cannot be defined, and also uh, uh, following a number of articles that have appeared more in, in the general press, aging is not considered an, an illness or a condition at the present stage of knowledge. And the, the, the sort of more basic research on biomarkers and, and the like is nevertheless interesting to uh, explore whether there is a common underlying mechanism to the muscle wasting that accompanies aging. So next slide. How do I measure a clinically meaningful effect? So in these models, you will have scales that are validated within these populations uh, that can measure um, a, a, an effect. Then you have to wonder, does the strength increase lead to a functional improvement? Because in the end, what will matter is that the patient is able to 
live and uh, and act uh, um, independently and uh, in a in a better way. What does, uh, for example, an SPPB score improvement in terms of improving clinical outcomes? I do not think that we have uh, uh, made a link. Well, we know that the SPPV is predicted to the risk of death or the, or, the, or, a, or the gate speed is predicted to the risk of death. We do not know what a change in those scores would do to improve sorry, <coughs> the clinical outcomes from the patients. And also, what is a minimum clinically important benefit? And this, again, may vary according to the population model that you choose. Next slide. The fact that the scale is widely used doesn't, doesn't mean that it's validated to in the populations and then in the models that we have said. So the scale or the biomarker content but may be clinically me meaningful. We can also um, uh, consider the, the, um, the development of prognostic biomarkers for asymptomatic or early stage patients to, to show the risk that they would develop sarcopenia. We don't know much of the trajectory of those biomarkers, uh, again, at the present stage of knowledge, uh, or how they would predict the response, and any confounding effects must be explored. So these are all areas where there are more questions than answers. And again, research in, in the biomarkers is interesting, I, I would like to repeat, more to, to, to either identify a population that will be followed for long-term studies. We have at the moment in Europe a study called SPRINT-T that is looking at development of sarcopenia at an early stage of the, of the syndrome, uh, and also for proof of concept. Now, next slide. If we were to have a, a dossier uh, which won't, uh, for, for a drug for sarcopenia, we would need to look at endpoints that matter and which tools can correlate with the clinical outcome. So we've gone through a number of these possible tools. And, and uh, if we look uh, in the next slide at uh, some confounding factors, we'll, we probably will want to see also an intervention as an adjunct to exercise and perhaps diet before the putting the patient directly to uh, a pharmacological treatment, and whether a reversal of the scores on the, on the scales uh, mentioned before improves the clinical outcome. So, so far we have received a number of advices that uh, are uh, uh, similar to the end of phase two meetings uh, at the FDA. And um, just to summarize what we have given as advice is that in general we would want to see in these models, a co-primary endpoint, a performance-based measure, a, and in addition, a patient-reported outcome. So to conclude in the last slide, I would ask and would be really grateful for any comments on the frailty guidelines. As I said, the deadline is the 31st of May. Um, we are willing to support uh, with advice uh, either for uh, the design of clinical trial or qualification of biomarkers, quality research work in sarcopenia, and we look forward to build a strong chain in this area. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Francesca, for your remarks. And I would like to open up the line to any questions. Um, please, again, if you have questions, um, we have a couple already, uh, please use the chat function on WebEx or email me at Benz uh, at agingresearch.org. So um, the first question um, uh, is um, related to the uh, CHMP um, 2016 pilot you mentioned on uh, 10 products in the geriatric population. Um, it, the FDA um, snapshots project you mentioned is making that information available to the public. Um, will the results of the pilot that you have also be available uh, publicly? Yes, when the CHMP approves the drug, we have what is called a European Public Assessment Report. For these 10 products, there will be an additional chapter added to the European Public Assessment Report, which will start with the epidemiology, and then it will be looked at the pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, efficacy, safety, and, uh, as, 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 and the specific section on the benefit-risk balance 
um, in the older population. So we, we try to sort of put together the information that was perhaps scattered across the, the, the IPAR in a single place and also somehow draw the attention of the reviewers onto the specifics of this population and uh, have a confirmation whether the benefit-risk balance can be extrapolated or concluded in the same or in a different manner in this population. And all of this will be published. Terrific. Um, the second question is related to um, timing of the uh, finalization of the, the draft paper on frailty. Um, I know just from, you're probably receiving a number of different comments um, and, and that would influence your timing, but do you have a sense of when um, you would like to see the final published? Well, uh, it's difficult to say at this stage because uh, we, n normally there is a surge of comments, you know, in the, in the last few days uh, of, mm -hmm. of the conversation, but we have received um, very well considered comments from the FDA and from a number of uh, geriatrics or, or medical societies that uh, are, are active in the older uh, people area. Um, probably, I would say, um, probably within six months from, from May, we may come with a proposal for, for a uh, approval of the final documents. There is, there is a number of co going backwards and forwards in between the various committees, so it depends also on their agenda and how busy it is to take up the topic, but uh, I, I'm optimistic. Great. Um, one other question is related to um, the slide on uh, the requirement for co-primaries for um, sarco uh, seeking an indication for sarcopenia as an indication. And I was just curious because um, the Aging and Motion Coalition so focused on performance measures. Um, has anyone approached EMA outside of um, the request for uh, consultation about you know, going through your formal process for qualifying a PRO measure? For sarcopenia? Um, no, but I heard the last week at the, at the World Conference on Osteoporosis that somebody is working towards one of this uh, SARC, uh, I don't remember how it was called, this instrument. I, 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 I had noted myself to look it up, but I haven't done because I've just come <laughs> back from that. But uh, I mean, the point is. Some of the patient reported outcomes are probably um, already there and it's just a matter of saying, would you consider that they're applicable in the population? We have had mm -hmm. the TF10, for example, I, I think it has been requested. And, and uh, in Europe, we also have what is a scientific advice with health technology assessment bodies who are the ones who look at the value, so the effectiveness and and um, of, of the product in, in, in real life and where it is situated as compared to other interventions. And uh, they as well put a lot of stock into patient reported outcomes. Uh, they, uh, if I remember correctly, again, the PS10 was in one of the advices that were given jointly with, with the HTAs. Uh, but uh, of course, if there is uh, in a, a, a scale that is tailored specifically to the to this population, maybe it will gain more acceptance. The point is, um, the, the approach is to see what is there, how predictive you think it is, and then ask for confirmation: would this be a suitable instrument? And uh, some of them have been accepted. Great. Um. Okay, uh, so one one other question um, is related to um, the fact that um, sarcopenia is not um, currently recognized as a condition, um, and that you know until then we sort of have to focus on models of disease. Um, I think you're aware that we're you know seeking to have a diagnosis of sarcopenia established. Um, how how does that or does that at all change um, how EMA is going to approach uh, their thinking around? Um, development programs in, in the area of sarcopenia? Does it eliminate any of the co-founding factors in your maybe, viewer? Maybe it will give a nudge into that direction. The point is, though, that uh, 
um, I think uh, uh, in the present state of knowledge, it is in, in spite of the confounding factors, it is probably easier uh, to use one of the models that we have talked about because <clears throat> in these cases you have uh, first of all the scales and also perhaps uh, uh, an understanding of what a reversal of certain scores that you have in the scales means for the well-being of the patients in in in, in these populations. Um, uh, if I can make a sort of parallel, like um, if you if you if you were to develop a a drug into uh, cancer cachexia uh, again, probably even in that respect at the moment, um, certain types of cancer in which you have studied the effect of the drug will be the ones who appear in the indication because I'm thinking like if you have, I don't know, colon cancer or it would be different from having prostate cancer probably in terms of the effect that you may have. And so uh, it, it is welcomed, but I think that what we need to also understand is to get a, an overarching indication is whether you can define a purely sarcopenic population, which is probably part of you having an ICD uh, code uh, attributed. And the second thing is, uh, once you have defined this population, what does a change in score do to improve the clinical outcomes in this population? And just one last question, um, and it's mine. <laughs> um, the, the one question I had is, you know, we're really interested, um, the nonprofit members of the coalition would really like to see more work on, you know, better understanding how um, treatments can be developed for, for older populations. And, you know, we think that we've, we've all just been really impressed with the fact that EMA has, has taken on the older adult population in a, a very strategic way. Um, were there any groups in particular that, that really pushed to, to have this focus? Um, you know, was it the regulators or was it industry or were there any other groups involved that sort of helped to, to move that forward? We have had a number of individual companies variously interested uh, coming up with advices, but there also has been a very strong uh, a drive, maybe because the European population is aging faster than the, than the American one, uh, in terms of research. And part as part of the financing of the research agenda in the last five years in Europe, specific funds on research on aging and degenerative disease have been put forward. And this has made possible, for example, the 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 funding of the SPRINT T trial, which is looking at factors relating on aging. It will look also at biomarkers as these cohorts are followed, um, which is something that, you know, industry could not have done just on its own. Um, and I have been just told that in the next funding cycle, uh, um, I don't remember if exactly it's on Horizon 2020, or uh, I don't remember which one, a new large, uh, again, uh, observational trial will start. Um, and I think that this is the, the kind of work that will elucidate um, what is the mechanism of aging. And if certain patients reverse their scores, that uh, doesn't mean that then they will survive longer or they will have less goals. Because ultimately what it is is independent, healthy living that does not add the, add the burden of cost to the healthcare system. Great. Um, well, it doesn't look like there are any more questions. Um, the AIM Coalition is actually going to be submitting comments uh, to EMA on the draft uh, frailty paper, and I would encourage all of you to do the same. Um, we're going to be making uh, the slides available on uh, AIM's website, aginginmotion.org, um, and we'll also, um, in about a week, um, have a full recording of this um, available on the website uh, for any of your colleagues or, or anyone else who you think uh, would be interested who wasn't able to participate.
Um, and you can always um, send information um, our way, and if you have questions, uh, we can make sure that, that we get them to uh, Francesca, um, or, or we'll be able to answer them ourselves. Um, and again, I'd like to thank you all uh, for joining this morning, and a, a really a special thanks to, um, to Francesca for making yourself available uh, to give this great presentation. And again, I'd just like to thank our sponsors, um, Abbott, Eli Lilly, GE, Hologic, Novartis, Nutricia, Regeneron, and Santa fee. Um, and that concludes the program. Thanks you all so much and have a great day. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Bye.